but you might find it useful to keep that passage open in front of you. I want to start with King Hezekiah, a good king, and there's a lot about him in Kings, but I just want to make one point. He was ill, and the prophet Isaiah went to him and said, put your affairs in order because you are going to die. And Hezekiah, who had been faithful to the Lord, prayed to the Lord to remember all the things that he'd done. And as Isaiah was leaving the palace, the Lord spoke to him and said, go back and tell him. And he gave him 15 more years. Now, during the time he was ill and recovering, envoys from a small country far away called Babylon came to see him. And they brought messages of greetings and comfort because the king had heard that he was ill and wanted to send this message. And Hezekiah was so delighted and obviously moved in a great way that he actually took these envoys around his palace, around the treasury, around the storerooms, and he showed them everything. And obviously they were taking notes and they left. And Isaiah the prophet came to him and said, what, did the, what were those people who came and what did you say to them? And Hezekiah said, I showed them everything in the storehouses, in the treasury, everything. And Isaiah said to him, there will be a day when they take everything you have shown them and even your children back to Babylon. And it says something about Hezekiah that he comforted himself by saying, it won't be in my lifetime. And years later, Nebuchadnezzar, great empire, we read about it in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem. He laid siege to the city. And for two and a half years, no one could go in or come out. And all that they had in the city was all they had. And if you read the book of Lamentations, it is about that siege. We don't know who the author of Lamentations is, but traditionally it's believed to be Jeremiah. And if you read the book, it's, it's a short book. It's not difficult to read, but it's very uncomfortable to read. Try and imagine the prophet looking over the city of Jerusalem and seeing the desolation after Nebuchadnezzar's army came in and destroyed everything. We've seen pictures in the last couple of years of the Ukraine, and you see cities that were once beautiful cities with nice architecture, and they've just been raised to the ground. And you look at them and you, can this ever be rebuilt? And if you think about the temple in Jerusalem, if you've been to Israel, you will almost certainly have stood on the Temple Mount. If you've not been to Israel, you probably have seen pictures of the Golden Dome of the Rock, where the Temple Mount used to be. But try and imagine standing on the Mount of Olives, and as you look across the valley, you see the mount, where the, uh, the place where the temple would have been, and the temple was made of white stone, dressed stone. And Solomon spurred no expense on the stone, on the gold, on the woodwork. It was truly magnificent. And if you saw the um, Mount of Olives and looked across in the sunlight, what you would have seen would have been a magnificent edifice to the glory of God. And it was the very center of worship. It was the center of Jewish life. Everything revolved around it. The commander of Nebuchadnezzar's army, Nebuchadnezzar, he actually destroyed the city. They pulled down every stone. They flattened it. Anything that was con uh, consumable, they burned. Anything that died could not be buried. And many thousands died. So if, if you imagine the prophet now looking at that desolation, the people have gone into exile to Babylon. All the riches of, Bab of Israel have gone. He's looking over this. And he sees this absolute horror. That's the basis for this book. I'm not going to go into too much detail because of the young people here. But some of the descriptions of cannibalism are truly horrific. If you haven't read the Book of Lamentations, 
I would suggest that you do read it because we learn a great deal from it. But there was something else about all of this that was really important. It was significant to the Jews because they knew all of it had happened at the inspiration of God. God had done this to them. If you read Deuteronomy 28, it's in two halves. There is a promise of great blessing upon the people if they are obedient to God. The second is a promise of a curse if they are disobedient. And if you read the curse and you read Lamentations, you can see actually exactly what happened. God persevered with them. And when the prophets came to the people and said what was going to happen, Jeremiah argued with them, he preached. But Jeremiah's ministry began with God calling him and telling him the people will not listen. And he even went to the point, the Lord said to Jeremiah, do not pray for them. I will not hear you. But Jeremiah preached, Isaiah preached, the prophets spoke to them and warned them that their disobedience, their wickedness would incur God's wrath. They would not listen. They looked at this wonderful temple and they saw that as the place where God resided, the Holy of Holies. God will not let anything happen to this. This wonderful place, he will not allow this to be destroyed. And Jeremiah warned them time and time again. And in fact, Jeremiah said to them, surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. Open the gates, let them in, and they will spur the city. They thought he was a traitor, and they tried to kill him. They had a view of God that was not correct. The warnings of the prophets, the warnings of their own scriptures, were that if they disobeyed, they'd be punished. They didn't believe it. We need to learn from this. Our society needs to learn from this. Today, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, there are many, many clergy in the major denominations who whenever we talk about hell or punishment or the wrath of God, they have, they have a standard response. God is love. God loves us. He won't let this happen. I actually read uh, an article um, and the writer said, God wants us to be happy. There's nowhere in scripture does God say, I want you to be happy. There is a lot in scripture where God says, I want you to be holy, a holy people. And a holy people in a sinful world will stand out and will face persecution. But then you find the liberal end of the church will say, oh, if you, you don't persecute, actually just go with the world and everything will be good. And we can show them that God loves them by opening our doors to all the things they want to do. Well, this passage actually highlights that God isn't an easygoing God and he will punish sin. But then the prophet... And this actually, if you were to read in, in the Hebrew, is five poems. It doesn't come across in the English because the poetry of the Hebrews doesn't translate easily. But the prophet, he looks at all this, this devastation, this horror, and he says this. I'm going to read it again, but this time from the ASV. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. What the prophet is saying is, I look at this desolation, this horror, I see what has happened. But I remember the scriptures. I remember the promise of the scriptures, that even when God rebukes and punishes, it's only for a time. And Jeremiah wrote to the exiles in Babylon, and in his letter, he said, settle down, have families, buy land, do business, do trade, 
for 70 years and the Lord will restore you. And that is where that wonderful promise where the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to bless you. But that is to a people in exile who experience punishment. So God is saying, even to people who've been punished, I have plans for you and they're good. And as the prophet remembers this, that is when he says that mercies are new every morning. No matter how bad things are, God's mercy is always there. And how is he merciful in this exile? So many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands survived. They were not wiped out. In that time, whole civilizations were wiped out. The Assyrians were famous for wiping out civilizations, for taking people from one part of the empire, putting them somewhere else so they would lose all of their identity. The Jews never did. Even today, they have an identity. We should pray for Israel. We should pray because there are people becoming Christians in Israel. And it's actually, big. the more laws they pass to stop it, the church gets bigger. The more desperate they become, so the more stringent those laws are. And we should continue to pray for Israel because that is where God is working. And if the Jews can't believe us, and we had a huge nation of Jews who were all believers, the evangelism, it would be like setting off a spiritual atomic bomb. It would just travel around the whole world, pray for Israel. But they've never lost their identity. They've lost their belief in God to a large part, but they can regain that. But in this passage, we have a situation where God is fulfilling his promise of, Deut of Deuteronomy 28. The people are being punished. They know he's doing that. And the prophet has got hope. And hope is certainty that God has not abandoned them. It's not wishful thinking. I don't need to say this to you, but if you're doing something next Saturday outside and you hope the weather is going to be good, that's just wishful thinking. But Christian hope is a knowledge that whatever happens to me, he is in charge. And he's not promised that John Ritson is going to escape any kind of difficulty or suffering. In fact, we are told in scripture, if you read your Bibles, suffering is part of the Christian package. We don't like to think about that. But actually suffering, spiritually, physically, emotionally, it's all part of the Christian package. And what keeps us going is what we see here. The God we serve. The prophet looks at the desolation and he doesn't look, where can I find help? He acknowledges God. Now I know people who think this is their favorite passage in scripture. They have no idea where it comes from. And one of the things about this passage, some years ago, um, I was on the prairie in Canada. If you've been to the uh, Canadian prairies, they are vast and there's nothing in them. There's just this dry grass and dust and nothing. You don't look at any trees anywhere or hills. They're just flat, boring plains, which is why the army liked them so much. But we had to sleep outside. And you sleep outside on the ground. And you have a sleeping bag and a mat. Uh, and that's it. There's no tent. And you lie at night looking up. And if there's no moon, you cannot comprehend the depth of the darkness. There's nothing. You, wherever you look, it's just black. There's no ambient light, except that the stars shine beautifully. And there's lots of them. It's incredible. The sky seems so big. Wherever you look, it's just stars. And if the moon comes out, that's a whole different thing again. It's like a stage scene. The moon just doesn't look real. Now, the reason I'm saying that is those stars shine brightly because it is so dark. This passage, which is so tremendously full of hope, is more powerful when you realize where it's coming from. It's coming out of the depth of the darkness of lament for a city and a people that have been destroyed. And the prophet says, in this I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. How can you say that when you look at what's just happened? Because surely, again, in a modern day thinking, if God loves me, he's not going to do anything bad. 
He's going to make my life wonderful. He wants me to be happy. It's totally unrealistic. And sadly, if people have that perception, when things go wrong in their Christian lives, they just quit because they're not told the truth. But if they are told the truth from the start of what their Christian life is like, then when the difficulties come, they don't fall apart, they don't fall on the floor, they don't start screaming and shouting. They look to the one who can help them. And that is where we need to look. We live in a nation. I don't know, if, I mean, you know as well as I do. We live in a dark place. Life is very good. In the southeast of England, life is really very comfortable in so many different ways, apart from the roads. You've got the worst traffic I've ever been in. But we're very comfortable. But Britain and the West are in a really dark place. Emotionally, spiritually, morally, it is a really bad place to be. Do we give in? Do we keep quiet when we should speak? Do we take risks? Are we faithful? I'm not going to answer for you. You each have to answer that question for yourself. The easiest way to respond is just to sit quietly with your head down and just hope it goes away, a bit like Hezekiah. But the truth is we have got to be disciples who are prepared to stand firm in the face of some of the most horrific accusations still love still care still witness still be faithful but i'm not looking to you to support me or the people in my church he's the one that we need to keep in touch with if we start to become cowardly or weak or fretful it's because we've lost sight of the god we worship we've lost sight of the scriptures that can feed us It says in 3.21.26 that it's only for a time that God will not always be angry. But if we look at the world today, and I'll leave you to correct me about this afterwards, when I read the letter to the Romans and what Paul says about society and about the wrath of God, what I see in Britain is happening in the rest of the West, but what I see in Britain actually is almost out of the scriptures and it's an indication that God's wrath is being revealed and God's wrath isn't having a tantrum and shouting and yelling it is a slow burning tem uh, anger which will be we shall see it and we shall experience it because we deserve it when we see what's happening in our society and people I mean one of the most offensive things is gay pride to be proud of something that the Bible condemns. It's almost throwing in God's face contempt. And we're told very clearly that God will not tolerate contempt. Now I'm going to try and leave you on a good note now, because it's all a bit heavy really, isn't it? So let me just say to you this. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Friends, tomorrow morning, I pray that every one of us, when we wake up, our first thoughts will be of Jesus and the day ahead that he will reveal to us his mercies for the day. When I first became a Christian, my parents, they've long been, they've been Christians and they've become very nominal. And I used to pray regularly that they'd wake up in the morning and the first thing they would think of is Jesus and years later my mum they, they came back to the Lord because they saw what happened to the son but years later my mum said to me do you know every morning when I wake up my favorite hymn what a friend we have in Jesus God answered the prayer and I'm praying it now for you that in the morning today tomorrow every day we'll wake up and whatever we face, new mercies every morning, because his love is steadfast, and in that we are secure. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.